So last week we began in our study, um, new study here in the book of Nehemiah. Title for it, Arise, Rebuild, Defend. As I said last week, we will find um, uh, either these words or uh, these themes throughout uh, this study in the book of Nehemiah. And I, I am so excited about it. I think it's really going to be just uh, an incredible study. Last week, uh, I believe, was just uh, so great in his word. We covered the first uh, seven verses. And what I'd like to do tonight is just recap these first seven verses very quickly. So from the top, if you would follow along with me, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. It came to pass in the month of Kislev in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the, its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, and mourned for many days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant. I love that. God keeps his covenant. God always keeps his word. Amen? Amen. Who keep your covenant. Mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. So last week, and if you weren't here, you can listen online, uh, go to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel there, and you can, get, uh, you can uh, catch up on, on videos from uh, different uh, sermons if you missed. And so I encourage you, if you weren't here last week, to catch up, being that that was the first week, and uh, we kind of went into a bit of the backstory. So I'm not going to uh, uh, rehash that again this week. As it was brought before him, he's recognizing this issue as it was brought before him as to the situation to the walls around Jerusalem. And we're going to pick up really where we left off last week in verse 8. Of course, remember that he is uh, before the king there in the Persian Empire. And let's read here verses 8 and 9. It says, Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the furthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them uh, from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Nehemiah, Nehemiah puts into practice a very useful principle here. He quotes scripture to the Lord in his prayer. Now, I don't know if you've ever done that before when you've been uh, in prayer with the Lord, but we have biblical precedents of quoting Scripture. We see it here. We see it elsewhere in the Word of God as well. And if we see it in the Word of God, then it must be a very powerful thing indeed to do, to quote God's Word back to the Lord. Not that God does not know his word, not that God is not aware of his word, but remember that when we pray, 
and we're praying before him, it's a reminder to us of his word. It's an encouragement to us of what God has already previously said or previously spoken or foretold. And Nehemiah is in that practice, putting in that practice, quoting scripture to the Lord in prayer. I love that. And how many times that when I'm in prayer and I'll quote God's word back to him from memory as it applies to what I am praying or the request or, or the praise uh, that I'm giving before the Lord or the worship or whatever it may be. In fact, something that can be so powerful is to have your Bible open with you perhaps when you pray. Great book for that would be, of course, well, any book of the Word of God is. It's all the Word of God, but Psalms are wonderful for that. Proverbs are wonderful for that. The Gospels, and on and on it goes. And to pray God's Word, to quote God's Word back to Him, to pray God's Word to Him, and it is a very, very powerful thing to do. By the way, if you've ever been in that position where, like, I don't even know what to pray right now. And I think sometimes all of us are in that place where, I don't know, you're, you're just having maybe one of those days and you're just, or maybe you're, you're praying about a situation and you're like, Lord, I pray for such and such. And then you go, and Lord, there's this situation with that person and I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to pray. And sometimes we're reading through God's word as we're praying and God gives us the very words and you'll never be short of what to pray to God if you pray God's word or read God's word in the midst of your prayer. It is honestly a very, very uh, powerful thing to do. In fact, I'm just going to share something with you for a moment. Again, if you're wondering, oh, I, 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 yeah, my prayer life is struggling. My prayer life is suffering. And, and I just, I, I, I get into that prayer closet before God and I just don't know what to say. I just opened up right here to Psalm 48. Psalm 48, verse 1. You don't need to turn there. And I would do something like this. I would read this verse. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. And then I'd read that to the Lord and I'd say, Lord, you are great. Lord, you are so great. And Lord, talk about worthy to be praised. If there's anyone worthy to be praised, you're worthy to be praised. And, and more than anyone or anything else, well, because your word says that you're greatly to be praised. And your word makes it clear that you're the true and living God. And before you know it, I'm off and I'm praying God's word. And it's such a powerful thing to do. And I just want to encourage you this evening to put that into practice. But... What goes in is what comes out, right? Like they say, or Carmen said back uh, uh, in the 80s, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, I'm not going to have a, uh, I don't know, I guess a, a lean body if I'm living off of French fries and chocolate chip ice cream, you know, morning, noon, or night, you know? Not that I have a problem with French fries and chocolate chip ice cream, you know, just saying, you know, but I'm just saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out. The same thing in our spiritual walk, folks. Are we listening? Garbage in, garbage out. Or nothing in, there's nothing to come out. Sometimes we're dry on the the outgo because we're dry inside. Perhaps we're dry in what we're giving out to our family, in our witness, in the body of Christ, whatever, in our own Christian walk. And there's that dryness. And it, if, it, if it permeates and continues for any length of time, my friends, it could be because we have not brought, put in, you see, I like what my wife says all the time, what you feed is what's going to grow. If I feed the flesh, the flesh will grow. Oh, it will grow. If I feed the spirit of the things of the Lord, then I will grow spiritually. But if I starve myself myself spiritually, then I'm not going to grow spiritually. And so if you wonder, why am I not growing? Because you got to get going you got to get going into the presence of the Lord, into the Word of God. What goes in is what comes out. We may be those who don't starve ourselves of God's Word or, 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 well, be spiritually sick, 
We can be spiritually sick if we starve ourselves of God's word, I should say. Or if we, or we can begin to waste away. Or we'll be weak if we starve ourselves of God's word. If this is what we call the meat of God's word, then if I don't partake of that meat, and if I just keep on taking the milk and the milk and the milk and the milk, and there's a lot of milk out there, okay? And there's a lot of milk if we allow it into our family and into our own personal walk. And if I just allow the milk and the milk and the milk, well, then I'm going to stunt my growth, just as that would happen uh, with any of us physically growing up, or our children, or our grandchildren. You see, and we'd waste away, and we'd be weak. May we not be those who put into this vessel spiritual junk food. May we not be those who do that, spiritually seeking of the religious things that have no biblical significance in our lives. For we will, if we do such, will be spiritually unhealthy. We will be spiritually unhealthy. May we feast upon the meat of his word, upon the meat of his word in which we grow. Again, what I feed is what will grow. And in this prayer, he was confident that God would keep his word. Again, look at this. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. God is a keeper and he keeps his word and he keeps his covenant and he keeps his promises. Please, again, it says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open so that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. And he goes on again to uh, elaborate about this whole matter. Now, verses 10 through 14. Verses 10 through 14. It says, Now these are your servants, and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand, which, by the way, we can't take any credit. We can't take any credit for the redemption of God. When God redeems, when God does that work, it is the work of God. It is the mighty hand of God. It's not our hand. It's not by our strength. Not at all. It's not the arm of, of, of the flesh, but it's by the arm of the Lord, by the power of God. Scripture says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Right? And so it says in verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants, who desire to fear your name, and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. What do we see here in verse 11? We see your servant, and then the prayer again of your servant, and then again, let your servant. He keeps on speaking to the Lord that, Lord, I am your servant. And all of us are going to serve something or someone. I think what is most common in this life is to be self-serving. We see so much of that today, don't we? The serving of self, the putting uh, at the forefront self. Yet God's word makes it so clear that we are not to think such of ourselves as to elevate ourselves above others, but that we are to put others, not to necessarily elevate them, but to put them before ourselves. And why such? Well, because first and foremost, we're to put God at the forefront of our lives. And as we walk with the Lord and we love the Lord and we serve the Lord, He gives us what we need to serve others. He gives us what we need to love others. If we struggle in our love of others, it is very likely it's because we struggle in our love towards God. It's very likely. Because as we grow in the love of the Lord, He gives us what we need. He gives us what we need in loving others and in serving others. 
Nehemiah's prayer asks for God's blessing to take action, for him to take action. Lord, I am moved by the report that I have received from my brother and from the others that have come with him up from Jerusalem. I am moved by this, and I bring it before you in prayer. Sometimes we're moved by things, and sometimes we can be moved by a very good thing. Yet, at times, we're moved by something, and we take it directly to action. And don't get me wrong. I think that it's important to be men, women, youth, of action in our lives. But let us not be those who take action before we take it to the throne room of prayer. And this is what he does. He takes the word, the report that comes his way, and he takes it first to God in prayer. And then what I like, and what we'll see, of course, throughout this book, is that Nehemiah doesn't take it there and leave it there and pray for action on just merely other people's parts. But he prays, Lord, show me what my part is, what my place is, what I am to do. Show me my part, Lord God. And so Nehemiah's prayer asks for God's blessing to take action. I like what Warren Wearsby said. He said, when God puts a burden on your heart, don't try to escape it, for if you do, you may miss the blessing that he has planned for you. Again, when God puts a burden on your heart, don't try to escape it, for if you do, you may miss the blessing that he has planned for you. Remember the shepherd boy, David, when he was aware of Goliath. He goes down to bring those cakes to feed his brothers that were out there on the battlefield. You probably remember the army of Israel situated opposite the army of the Philistines and the great leader, the great uh, warrior of the Philistines. His name was Goliath. He had brothers as well. Which, by the way, I don't know if you recognize this or not, but when you read uh, there in the Word and you read the account that uh, David had picked up uh, a few stones, I think it was five stones, if memory served me correctly, but he picks up these stones, right? Why does it give the specific number of the stones that he picked up? Well, because he had intentions of not only killing Goliath, but he was going to go through and kill each and every one of Goliath's brothers as well. Nonetheless, he goes down there, to minister to his brothers. And he notices this situation, this this stalemate, so to speak. Goliath comes out, and every day he comes out, and he says, bring the one best of the nation of Israel to fight me. And if you win, then (laughs) then we flee. But if I win then I'm going to take, you know, over your land. You're going to flee. And we know the story. They were afraid of this Goliath. Goliath was a giant of sorts, literally. In fact, he's what we call a Nephilim. We talked about that in the past, and we're not going to get into it today. But he was a giant. And he had great strength. And all of the greatest of the fighting men of Israel... Of all of them, no one would even stand up to fight this man. But David, the shepherd boy, when he saw the situation, he heard of the situation, he was so moved. He was so, I think, disappointed in part that none of the troops of Israel would fight this man because he saw something that they didn't see. They were trusting in their flesh. And he said, I, he said, I come against you, uh, you, know, by the, you know, by the hand of God, basically. He recognized that the battle belonged to the Lord, and he gave it to the Lord. And the Lord, on that day, gave him great, great victory. 
He had a burden upon his heart, and that burden brought him to a place of action in his life. Maybe you're here this evening, and your heart has been heavily burdened, burdened by the need of some biblical change, some biblical action that needs to take place in your life, in your household, in your surrounding, and your heart has been so moved and you've been so burdened, and you go from day one to day two and week one to week two and month after month, maybe even year after year, and there's no change. I go back here to this quote again from Wearsby, when God puts a burden on your heart, don't try to escape it. For if you do, you may miss the blessing that he has for you. And so we see set before us those in Holy Scripture who have taken that stand. Nehemiah prayed first and put the matter before the Lord to pave the way. Nehemiah needed the approval of the king. And he couldn't just leave the king's presence because he was cupbearer to the king. It's kind of like in the armed forces today. You know, you sign up uh, for the armed forces and you don't have any rights. You become the property of the United States government. You don't have any rights other than what they say you have as rights. And how much more so back then in those days. And he was cupbearer to the king. The king had to allow him to go wouldn't be a very likely situation or scenario. Nehemiah wasn't just praying for God to raise others up, but to send him out, to send him. He took the lead, and again, in the coming weeks, we're going to see the plan of action that the servants who faithfully, faithfully followed and what God did in their lives and the attacks of the enemy And how the hand of God completed the work that needed to be done. So let's look here in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. And now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad? Since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. When we look at chapter 1, if you don't put the pieces together here, it's easy to... Here in chapter 2, verse 1, the month of Nisan is mentioned. Four months have gone by. Four months have gone by. Can you come in and set me up? Four months' time has gone by here. And this is important to understand and to uh, take note of here, that these four months have gone by. In chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, we see him uh, in prayer. And now here, the time has come on God's uh, calendar for there to be some action. So all of these months, or up to four months, I should say, um, it might have been a little less than that. Uh, We know four calendar months were involved. It doesn't mean it was necessarily a completed four months period of time. But in other words, the point to be made is that all of this time was going by. Anyhow, four months has gone by. Four months of time. And we see here that he's in prayer during this whole period of time. In prayer here. And the time has come uh, for some action. Nehemiah was patiently praying all along while his heart was stirred to action. He was praying all along. We tend to think of everything in terms of now, don't we? 
I do. I'm, I'm one of those now kind of guys. I'm definitely not a guy who likes to put things off. It's just not who I am. When a light burns out in my house, I'm not somebody who I just let that light bulb stay burnt out forever. It drives me nuts. Like, I am hyper-focused on that light bulb. I will go to bed and think to myself, tomorrow morning i got to change that light bulb. But I probably won't go to bed thinking tomorrow morning i got to change the light bulb because I'll get out of bed and I'll go change the light bulb because that's just how I am. I'm somebody who I like to get things done. I like to handle things, kind of be hands-on or whatever it may be. And yet we tend to think of things in terms of, of now uh, oftentimes, but Christian maturity often is going to be prayerfully and patiently waiting on God's timing. On God's timing. Hebrews, if you look on the screen, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those through faith and patience, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we're not called to be people that are lazy. We're not called to be people that are sluggish. No, but we are to imitate those through faith and patience who inherit God's promises through faith and patience and seeking God. Don't rush ahead of the Lord in your own strength. It never comes out well when you do. A couple of quotes here that I found so appropriate. Patience with others is love. Patience with self is hope. Patience with God is faith. And that's exactly what Nehemiah exercised. Patience with God. Patience with God. And then a German proverb that says, Patience is a bitter plant, but it has a sweet fruit. Patience is a bitter plant, but it has a sweet fruit fruit. When it comes to patience, we should remember three main words here that I believe you're going to see in Scripture. And if you're taking notes tonight, when it comes to patience, remember these words. Remember, stand, sit, and be. Stand, sit, and be. Let's look on the screen here at Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. It says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. So stand still. Ruth chapter 3, verse 18. Then she said, Stand still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. And then we also look at Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And so again, we see stand and sit and be. At, some, at certain points of time, we are called to stand or to take a stand. Other times, we're called to just sit it out. And other times, we are called to, as it says here, be, to be still. Stand still, to sit still, and to be still. Now, it was not permitted to be downcast in the presence of the Lord. It was not permitted to be downcast in the presence of, or I mean in the presence of the king. And so this caught the king's attention. It caught the king's attention. This brings me to the next point to consider. Think about this. Think about this. Don't you think that Nehemiah was ever troubled when he was before the presence of the king? Don't you think Nehemiah ever had a rough day, a bad day, a death in the family, maybe some kind of a health situation? You know, whatever it may be. That's part of life, isn't it? Part of life is the difficulties and the trials and the tribulations and the things that we go through in this life. So, of course, it would be, it would be reasonable to say that there were times that Nehemiah was very troubled as he arose and went to work, literally right before the presence of that king. 
And yet, and, and by the way, just as we are, right? We have those rough days. We have those rough days. We have days that we're troubled, days that we're saddened or whatever it may be. It happens. It happens to all of us. Yet what I think is really interesting here is that those things never put him over the edge. For all the period of time that Nehemiah served King Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes never noticed any downcast with Nehemiah in his countenance, any depression, any sadness, anything of that nature or sort. None of that was visibly seen to the king or known to the king. Only this was. This particular day, remember now, four months approximately had gone by, and he's praying about this, and he's troubled about this situation. And for whatever reason it was, this particular day, he was just overwhelmed, emotionally speaking, with this whole situation about the walls around Jerusalem. And he's before the presence of the king this day. He was troubled. He was troubled. But he was troubled over spiritual matters. You see, I think sometimes, and the point that I'm trying to make here is this. I think at times we get overly troubled and overly bothered by things that are not spiritual. And we can be downcast and we can allow ourselves to be depressed and filled with anxiety and miserable and the sort. And yet when it comes to spiritual matters... We just glide on through. I'm not saying us here, but I'm saying many times a Christian can, can be like that at times, you see. And over the spiritual matters, are we bothered by what's going on there? Are we burdened? Are we troubled by sin in the camp or sin in the household or whatever it may be, you see? And these are the kinds of things that get me thinking because... When it came to all the physical things, we saw nothing there of his countenance change. But when it came to a spiritual matter, a very big, deep, important spiritual matter, then we see, then we see his countenance has changed here. I believe what burdens us, and I believe what doesn't burden us, can speak volumes in our lives. Think about this. What things perhaps today or this week or recently have we been burdened with? And it's not to minimize those things, my friends, by any way, shape, or form. But what things do we allow to uh, burden ourselves with in any given day? Are those things anything that has eternal significance? Perhaps sometimes they are. But I would venture to say that so many times they're not. And a lot of times I think that we can tend to minor in the majors, speaking about spiritually, and major in the minors, speaking physically, emotionally, socially, economically, whatever it may be, you see? And that's the thing that concerns me. But when I read here in Nehemiah, I don't see that with Nehemiah. I see a man who is an amazing example of the Lord in which he serves. Now, verse 3 says, Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. And so I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, verse 3, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? This, this could have cost him his life. It's very common for a cupbearer to the king. If a cupbearer to the king ever 
was anything other than uh, happy in the presence of this king, okay? And hey, they're kind of like they say, fake it till you make it, okay? Maybe you're not happy. You better fake it, buddy, because if you don't fake it, you ain't going to make it because either the king is going to banish you if you're lucky or he's going to have your head. That was the reality of it. So those that were in the surrounding, you know, that, that were the advisors to the king and the servants to the king like that, they had to just, you know, kind of like, uh, what was it in uh, uh, Fantasy Island? Remember that show? I think it was Mr. Rourke or whatever. Smiles, everyone. Smiles, right? It was smiles. That was a requirement. That was a requirement. And so this could have cost him his life. And so we see here that he was, again, very, very deeply moved. And he was very deeply moved because of spiritual matters, because of the condition of the walls around Jerusalem. Verses 4 through 5, then the king said to me, what do you request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. I believe in this uh, here probably very short uh, moment that he had he prayed very quietly and he prayed very quickly again what does it say here the king said to me in verse 4 what do you request and so i prayed to the god of heaven look when it says he prayed to the god of heaven he didn't you know oh lord god and make some big show of it you know you ever seen christians like that some Christians like to make a big show. I don't know if they're trying to, to convince others or they're trying to convince themselves. But there's no big show that's needed here. He doesn't have time to carry on. He didn't have time for that. There's something short and sweet, probably something under his breath. How many times have you been in a situation like that? Perhaps at work, right? Perhaps at work and you're like... <laughs> Oh, Lord, you know, your situa situation happens. Lord, give me wisdom. Maybe you get a knock at the door, right? And you answer the door. And it's Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons, right? And I hope when that happens that you minister to them and tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need the gospel. God has sent them right to you, right to you. If anything else, the longer you speak with them, the more you're delaying them from speaking and giving those lies to somebody else, right? So I'll, I'll take as much time as they take. In fact, then they get to the point with me where they're like, okay, well, uh, uh, we've got to get going now. Oh, no, no, but wait, I've got to ask you this. This is so important, you know, and I'll ask them this, and I'll keep them longer and keep them longer, and I'm sure they probably put me in some database, like, watch out for that guy, you know. I, I really wonder. I do. I, I do. And when you're right before a situation like that, you're like, Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, give me the scripture. Or, or I might pray something like, oh, Lord, soften their hearts. You know, or whatever it may be. And it's just something really quick before the Lord. And here the king asks him a question, and he says, So I prayed to the God of heaven. He brings it up to the Lord. He lifts it up to the Lord. So important for us to do in our walk. Nehemiah's response is classic and exemplary in that he didn't say, Send, send someone else to do this work. He didn't say that. Again, verse 5 says, I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah and to the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. Again, wow, look at this. He didn't say send someone else that they may rebuild it. He didn't say that. He said send me that I may rebuild I like when people, um, and I don't know, I, I, I think I learned this from pastors many, many years ago, probably in my early 20s or so, that when you got an idea, maybe you're the one to implement it. A lot of people have a lot of ideas. Let's do this in the church. Let's do this. Let's embark on this grand project. Let's do that thing. Let's change this or whatever. And, and so many times those ideas are fantastic and great ideas. But some people are those individuals where they love to shoot out ideas uh, like bullets out of a, a semi-automatic, you know? And you're just like, whoa, 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 wait. Okay, and a lot of times, and I had to learn this myself, a lot of times my response is going to be, okay, so how do you want to get started with that? 
What's your plan of action? You know, how many people are you going to get involved? Uh, what, what's your plan for training up people to serve in that position? What, you know, whatever it might be. And then, well, 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 hey, man, you know, if you've got the idea, right, maybe it's upon, maybe God is stirring your heart. You know, here I am, Lord, send them. No, here I am, Lord, send me. You see, what is our part in this? And here he is saying, I'll be that person. He could have used excuses. We all have them. Every one of us have excuses. I got excuses. We all got excuses. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. Well, I'm tired. I'm busy. I don't sleep all at night. I got all this, you know, pain with my back and pain with my neck and pain here and pain there. I've got this issue. I've got to, I've got to finish doing the work on my house. You know, there's a leak in the roof, and then you finish the roof on the house, and then there's, well, then there's the, the issue where i got to replace the carpet, and you replace the carpet. Now, well, i got to change the oil on my car. You know, endless excuses, and yet what's happening in the kingdom of God, you see? That's what changes our lives and changes other people's lives. And serving the Lord. He could have used excuses, but he didn't. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. Send me, Lord. Now don't get me wrong. It's not always God's will to send us in that situation. It's not always God's will to use us in that situation. Maybe we were a soundboard for something. But I believe if we start with the attitude, Lord, send me. Lord, use me. Lord, what's my place? Then he'll guard or guide us and direct us from there. Maybe our place is as a prayer warrior in that. Praise God, we need more prayer warriors. We should all be prayer warriors. But maybe that's our position. But I believe if we start with the position of, Lord, what do you want me to do? You see? And then if God takes us from that into another path, so, you know, pray or, or just stand back. You were just the one to, to, to mention the, you know, the need there or whatever. Then God will bring change to that. But a lot of times, a lot of Christians don't have that approach. You see? And then the work doesn't get done. Here I am, send me. What faith Nehemiah had to even ask of such a thing of this Persian king? I mean, seriously, amazing faith. When we walk by faith, I'm going to tell you something. We do things that we otherwise would never have done before when we walk by faith. I can say that in my own Christian life. I can look back over years doing so many different things things that I didn't know how to do. Honestly, I don't know or haven't known how to do most of the things that I've done in all of the years of my Christian walk and in my Christian service. I really haven't. And there wasn't any really even anyone really teach me or mentor me. Uh, it was kind of more so on-the-job training <laughs> in my Christian walk. You know, it's kind of like uh, y trial by fire or whatever they call it. But you know what, though? The exciting thing is, is how God has used that. And you take those steps of faith and those ventures of faith. And again, when we walk by faith, we do things that we otherwise uh, oftentimes would not have done before. Was it not faith that Joshua, that Joshua was willing to take the land of Canaan, even though, of course, there were those that brought back the bad report, right? There were those that brought back the bad report, but he saw that the Lord was in this. He was willing to commit it to the Lord. He was willing to trust in the Lord. And, you know, we can find that oftentimes in our, in our walk. You're going to find those that have the bad report and those that have the good report. You know, you're going to see the negative. Maybe you'll see the, the positive uh, in that as well. He recognized they left God out of the equation, and he put God right in the midst of the equation. As we say from Scripture, God, things are possible. So Joshua was willing to take the land of Canaan. Or what about the faith of the apostles at times to heal the sick? You know, absolutely amazing. God has given us faith. He's given us faith to serve him in our lives. He's given us faith to serve him in and with this building. Getting this building was a step of faith 
Starting this ministry was a step of faith. Lots of steps of faith that we take in our personal walk as well. But without taking those steps of faith, what a boring Christian existence we have. How boring that is. And I want so much more. And so, verses 6 through 8, Then the king said to me, The queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. And furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let your letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And I got to think to myself, if he wouldn't have asked, he never would have received it. If he wouldn't have asked. What does scripture say? You have not because you ask not. Now, there are those that take that scripture out of context and say, well, I asked, so that means God's got to give it to me. God doesn't have to give you anything. He's God, and we are not. He's not the divine uh, genie in the bottle. We rub the lamp, and, you know, we get our wishes or whatever it may be. May we never in our Christian walk trivialize a holy, righteous, omnipotent God in such a manner. He is holy, my friends. But we know that Scripture says that at times that we don't have, we don't have because we fail to ask. And why do we fail to ask at times? Because at times we struggle with the issue of faith. Or we have at times a lack of faith. And so he asks and he receives. And wow, did he ask? I mean, he asked for the whole enchilada, man. And he got it. I love the saying, where God guides, God provides. Where God guides, God provides. He needed building supplies. He needed building supplies to do this project that needed to be handled. And he trusted God to provide. How many times do Christians say, well, if everything comes together, then I'll serve God in that capacity or then i'll do that away a lot of times we like all the information we like everything up front but then where's the matter of faith where does faith come in remember what it says in the book of hebrews that faith is the evidence of things what not seen i call that evidential faith a lot of people say well you christians you have blind faith oh no my friend you have no comprehension of this matter whatsoever. There is, I suppose, such a thing as blind faith. But then there's what I call evidential faith. Faith that is the evidence of things unth- unseen. We have unseen things, and yet we know that those unseen things, okay, they are the evidence, rather. We have this evidence, and we know this evidence speaks to what we don't see. What would be an example of that? Well, we can go outside tonight if there's no clouds out there. I don't know if it's cloudy out there or not. Right. But on a, on a night that's not cloudy, and you look in the, in the sky at night, and you see the stars. Well, where did those come from? Okay? Or you look at wonders like the Grand Canyon or the Niagara Falls, right? And you're in awe of God. I know a couple of years ago, Kathy and I uh, drove out uh, north of here, until we got to an area where we were away from the city lights, and it was one of those nights there was a media shower, and we're just watching all this coming down, and we could see, uh, you know, one of the arms of the, of the Milky Way galaxy, and we were, just, we were out there, and we were just praying to the Lord, and we were just praising the Lord, and just in awe of God and his creation. You see, I've seen his hand of creation, but I haven't seen his hand. Do I need to? No. Absolutely not. All of us have gotten sick, right? Some of us have perhaps had cancer. In fact, many people in their uh, lives will get, if they live long enough, some form of cancer or another. All of us have had different forms of sickness. Well, have I ever seen 
I had pneumonia when I was a kid. Did I ever see the pneumonia in me? No, but I saw what the pneumonia did. I knew I had pneumonia. You see what I'm saying? We see the hand of God. We see the handiwork of God. We see the wonders of his creation. When you see something created, it speaks to a creator. When you see art, it speaks of an artist. You see? So like I've said before, I had a couple of classic cars. I had a 1947 Chevy uh, Fleet Line. I had a 1948 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. I had a 1970 Pontiac Grand Prix. My wife hated that car. <laughs> and I've always loved classic cars. And when I see that kind of stuff, I think to myself, that's art. To me, it's just, it's art. It speaks of an artist. I never think to myself when I've seen a classic car, it's amazing how all these pieces just kind of flew together and whoosh, formed a 1948 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Okay? They'd be carrying me out in a straitjacket. I see art, and it speaks of an artist. I see creation, it speaks of a creator, okay? And that's the point here that's being, uh, that I believe we need to make. And so it all comes down to trusting the Lord and committing the matters of life to him, you see? And so in verses 9 through 10, and we're going to end here tonight. It says, And then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. And now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. And when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come, speaking of himself, to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. This trip took approximately two to three months to go from where he was there um, uh, in uh, uh, the capital there, uh, Shushan, 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 uh, to Jerusalem. Took about two to three months to make that trip, okay? Now, when these men heard, these specific men right here, ungodly men, heard of Nehemiah's mission, they were not happy about this at all. In fact, they would set out with great effort, as we will read in the coming weeks, to oppose this effort. It makes me think how many times we determine to walk by faith. How many times we determine to do the work that the Lord has set before us. And we're on a course. We know God is, is, is saying, okay, you know, Becky, or okay, Kurt, or okay, Andrea, or okay, Daniel, or, you know, this is what I have for you. Go out and do it. And we're excited. We're like, wow, man, this is so cool. God's going to use me to do something. And we start to do something, and then we come up against opposition. And we're like, oh man, everything was going fine in my life until I started to do something. Well, maybe God isn't in this. Rubbish! I believe so many times that when we come against the opposition that we come against, it often, it very often is because God is in it. And it is the enemy who is constantly trying to frustrate God's people, trying to slow God's people down. Everything was great until I started going to church. Everything was great. Look, I know of a guy. He's passed away now. Very successful businessman until he gave his life to the Lord. And I'm telling you what, everything fell apart in this guy's life. His business fell apart. He lost his gorgeous home. I mean, you want to talk about just everything falling apart, seriously. But he wasn't falling apart. He was coming together as a born-again, newbie believer in Jesus Christ. You see? And so many times when we set out to serve God, we get involved in a particular area of ministry. We've got a guy here in our church gotten involved in a particular area of ministry almost to the day that the guy was like, okay, I'm going to do this. 
Is anyone else doing it? I'll do it. It was kind of like the here I am, send me, Lord, kind of thing. And almost to the day, wow, I mean, it's like issue after issue after issue after issue, attack after attack, thing going wrong after thing going wrong after thing going wrong. And I encouraged him saying, praise the Lord. God's using you, man. And you're crossing a line and the enemy doesn't like it. Don't give up because that's what the enemy wants. That's what the enemy wants. He comes to kill, steal, destroy. He loves to discourage. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And he will do whatever he can, pulling out of his bag of tricks to stump you, to slow you down, to discourage you, to dismay you. If things have been getting rough in your life and you've been stepping it up in your prayer, in your prayer life, in your devotions with the Lord, in serving, in raising your kids in the way of the Lord, right? And you've been stepping it up in being a, an example at work, a better example at work, starting to tell people about the gospel of Christ, starting to talk to your neighbors, and things are falling apart. Praise the Lord. Not because things are falling apart, but because the enemy has taken notice. And the enemy is going to try and push you back and push you back. And I'll tell you this, he's watching. He watches and he studies. He does. And if he knows that his plan of action works, and how he knows it works is when we give up, I'm done. Forget this kind of attitude. That's exactly what he wants. Your life will get so much, so to speak, better. Not spiritually, but in the things of the world, perhaps. In the things of the flesh, perhaps, but not in the things of God. But I believe when we push through, and we push through, and we push through, when it's difficult, when it hurts, when it's hard, and we keep on just plugging away, and trusting the Lord, and crying out to the Lord. Oh, I believe God blesses that immensely. And eventually, I'll tell you what, the enemy does give up. He may come back another day with a new tactic to try something else to see if it works. But eventually he gives up. He does. Christians aren't called to give up, my friends. We're called to give it up. To give it up to the Lord. Amen? to give it up to the Lord. And so, you start stepping out in faith. Know that the enemy will oppose you. Don't be afraid of spiritual opposition. Expect it. Closing scripture this evening, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. It says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to the all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, verse 26, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. You see, the enemy, are, the, the, the point is that we are to escape the snares of the devil. Now, if Scripture says, and escape the snare of the devil, then that must mean that we are able to do so. You see what I'm saying? Because God doesn't set us up for failure, right? So if it says escape the snare of the devil, then that means that the enemy, first of all, desires to snare us. Second of all, that there can be an escape from that snare. Stop running from God. Maybe this is a word for someone tonight. I don't know. But stop running from God. Stop escaping God, okay? Run to Him and escape the snare or the snares of the devil. Don't run from God. Run to Him. Draw near to me, Scripture says, and I will draw near to you. Amen? Amen. Next week, we'll pick up in verse 11, let's pray. <laughs> draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. And Lord, again, we give you thanks that we can even draw near to you, that you even 
want us to and allow us to draw near to you, Lord God. That we can enter past the outer court and into the holy place and into the holy of holies. That we, through prayer, can do what the high priest could only do once a year. Only once a year could he go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and make atonement for himself and for the sins of the people of Israel. We can come before your presence, Lord God. Your word says that we can boldly come before your presence. Boldly. We've got the key to the house. The key is our lovely Lord Jesus Christ. We have the key. And you allow us to enter in. Lord, we don't have to make an appointment. <laughs> you are available 24-7. Anywhere, anytime, for as long or as short as we may wish, to boldly come before your presence. Oh, Lord. We give you thanks. We give you praise, O oh Lord. And we come before your presence tonight, Lord God. Each and every one of us do, Lord God. Myself and, and, and these guys beside me and the congregation around. Each and every one of us, Lord. We come before you tonight. And Lord, we pray for your strength. Be the strength of our life. Be the strength of our life. Be the strength of our life today, O oh Lord. As we sing in that song, every day I look to you to be the strength of my life. So, Lord, we do pray that. We need your strength. And, Lord, maybe we've been weak. Maybe we've been weak in the things of the Spirit. Lord, we pray may we be strengthened in you. Lord, maybe the enemy has been pushing and pressing in. Lord, may you give us strength to endure. May you give us patience, Lord God. May we not give up. May we not give in. May we truly give it up to the Lord. The battle, your word says, the battle belongs to the Lord. And Lord, forgive us how many times we try and battle it ourselves, battle it in the flesh. The battle belongs to you, O oh Lord God. The battle belongs to you. And when the enemy comes against us, he's coming against a child of the true and living God. When the enemy comes against us, he comes against a saint. When the enemy comes against us, he comes against a royal priesthood. He comes against the brethren, the sons and daughters of the true and living God. And, O oh Lord, I know that you take note. And Lord, I know that you are a God of justice. And Lord, I know that you are the God who sees. And you are the God who will deal with the enemy at your appointed time. But what you call us to do, Lord, is to trust and obey. Lord, your word says, if you love me, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Lord, we want to be a people who obeys your commands. We want to walk in your ways. We want to be pleasing to you, O oh Lord. We want to walk by faith. And so, Lord God, we pray right now in this room tonight for an increase of faith, an increase in seeking you, an increase in trusting you. Because, Lord, we need you. And may we be ever dependent upon you. If we think that we can do it on our own, oh Lord, what a dangerous place that is. The reality is, Lord God, is that you are our crutch. What people say as, as, a, as an insult to us is actually so true. Oh, you need, you need Jesus to be your crutch? Yes, Lord, I need you and we need you to be our crutch. Yes, because if I don't lean on you, then, Lord, uh, upon whom will I lean upon? And who, 
who else, Lord God, can bear the weight of our burdens? Your word says, come to me, you who are burdened and uh, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so, Lord, yes, you will be my crutch and our crutch. We will lean upon you. We will give our burdens to you. We will cry upon your shoulders, Lord God. And Lord, Lord, we know that you are attentive, Lord God, to the, the cries of your church, the pain in our heart, the things that trouble us, O oh Lord God. Lord, may we be like little Nehemiahs who are burdened with spiritual matters because we have such a passion for God in our lives. Make us people like that, Lord God. Rise us up, Lord God, as an army. An army, Lord God, of saints. That your word may go out from us, from our homes, from our workplace. That our God is God. That our God reigns. Lord, we praise you this evening. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name and all God's church said,